So today we're starting a new sermon series. Uh, it's called Together. If you have a Bible and you want to turn there, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10. We're we'll looking at verses 24 and 25. We'll read that together in just a second. Here's the, here's the whole, whole idea. We were never meant to live life alone. We were never meant to be in isolation. Together means that you should not have to walk through life, whether it's life's greatest times or, or some of life's worst times or, or anything in between. Um, you should not have to walk through life alone. Why? Because that's, that's, not how, that's not how we were created. We were created for community. Go back all the way to the very beginning. Uh, the beginning of creation, in matter of fact, Genesis 2, 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be what? Do you know? Alone, right. It's not good for the man to be alone. Together, um, is, it's, it's been there from, from the beginning. Together really is better. And that's something that you're going to hear me say over and over and over, that together really is better. And that's not just an idea for you and me. Think about in just in regular life, all the things that are, to be, that are better together. Okay, here's one. Chips and queso, better together, right? They're okay by themselves, but they're better together. Uh, peanut butter and jelly, one of my favorite togethers. Peanut butter and jelly, okay by themselves, but better together. By the way, does anyone put jelly on their eggs, their breakfast? Raise your hand if you do that. There's one, who else? Two, three, four, yeah, thank you. Would you please tell my wife that I'm not the crazy one? <laughs> yeah, so Peter, uh, Peter, Peter and Parker, uh, peanut butter and jelly. Uh, oh, popcorn and movies. That's a good one. Popcorn is great. Movies cool, but you got them together. They're just better. Hammer and nail. They work good. They're better together. Uh, milk and what? Cookies. Yeah, uh, they're both okay, but uh, put them together and it's, uh, it's life changing. Uh, here's one. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, Jerry Jones. Better, <laughs> better together. Uh, than they were separate uh, anyway. But seriously, life, life is better when we do this together. Now, there was a Harvard study that began back uh, in the Great, or towards the end of the Great Depression, around 1938, I think it was. And the whole idea was they wanted to do this longitudinal study, which means that they wanted to carry it on for years and years. Uh, and, and what they wanted to see, were, try to reveal what are some of the clues to healthy and happy lives. And they started following 200 and 68 Harvard sophomores. Okay, this is back in 1938. And of the original 268, as of um, when I was reading this, as of 2017, I think there were 19 that were still alive. Um, so I'm sure in the last uh, two or three years, we may have lost some more. But they were all in their mid-90s. And among the original recruits, by the way, uh, one of them in this study was, was President John F. Kennedy. Um, and so what happened, was, and there were no women in the study initially because back then in 1938, Harvard was still an all-male school. And so, but researchers eventually what they did is they expanded their study uh, to include the men's, uh, their, their children, their offspring. Uh, this number was about 1,300 and, and a lot of their offspring, a lot of their kids were in their 50s and 60s. And they just wanted to find out how early life experiences affect health and affect aging over um, over time and through the years, the control group, they've, they've kind of ex expanded things. In the 70s, in the early 1970s, uh, the Harvard researchers, now granted, you know, these researchers have been passing this study along uh, to, to, the, to the next set of researchers. But in the 70s, they added 456 Boston inner city um, residents. They, they were enlisted as part of the study and there were 40 of them um, that, that, were, that were still alive. So it's just... And then more than a, a decade ago or so, they started including the wives of, of some of these, some of these, these men um, who were in the original ones. Um, and so just through the years that they studied these participants, they looked at their health trajectories, they looked at their broader lives, they looked at their, you know, how successful they were in business or not successful, they looked at their marriages, how they were successful in those, uh, their ups and downs. And, and really what they found out was, was something that they weren't really even thinking about or looking for. Uh, a quote from one of the directors, his name is Robert Waldinger. He says, the surprising finding is that our relationships and how happy we are in our relationships has a powerful influence on our health. He says, taking care of your body is important, but tending to your relationships is just as important. It's just as an important part of self-care. And he said, I think that's for him, he goes, that was one of the biggest revelations. And he said, close Close relationships more than money or fame are what kept people happy throughout their lives. 
Because community or together or relationships, they, they protect people from life's discontent. They help, it helped delay a mental. They saw this in their research, mental and physical decline. And relationships were better predictors of, of long and happy lives, more so than the social class they were into, more so than their IQ, and more so than, than even in their, in their genes. And he said, you can sum up, basically you can sum up this whole 80 year or 80, more than 80 year long study uh, this way is that um, embracing community helps us live longer and it helps us to be happier. And I was reading another article about this study and this is what it's, it, it said. It said loneliness kills. It says it's as powerful as smoking or alcoholism. And so the researchers, they, they, were, they were totally shocked by what they found, but as, as followers of Christ, as people who know the Lord, um, it probably... It shouldn't be any surprise to us because that's how God created us. He created us for community. So it makes sense that our happiest we are, our most healthy that we are, our most joyous that we are, and most peace that we are, is when we're doing what we were created to do and God created us to be in relationship, to, to, to be together because life really is better together. So let's read that Hebrews, those two verses in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 24 and 25, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right after 24 and talk a little bit, and we'll hit 25. But anyway, 24 says, And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. Pause right there. So some of your Bibles may say, let us consider. So mine says, let us watch out. Yours may say, let us consider. But the whole idea is that we're attentively fixed on one another. We're, we're, con- we're contemplating, we're considering um, the people in our lives and, and, and their wants and their needs. But here's the reason why. So that we can render mutual, okay, me to you and you to me, mutual help and counsel. And you can't do that in isolation. And why should we, why should we be so focused on one another? Why should we have such a high priority for together? Well, because it's right there. Because together we, we provoke love. We provoke one another to love and good works, now, you think provoke, and a lot of you have a negative connotation to that. I know I, know I do. You hear that, and you think, well, oh, they, they provoked me to anger. Or my kids, the way they were acting, that, they just provoked me. That's why, that's why, I, that's why I yelled at them. But um, in, in the Greek here, this, this term, has its, it has its negative connotation, but there's also several positive connotations that go with it. And this is, this is one of them, and, and it's what we see here in this past. And it says, it, it's, it's more so, it's a positive and, and it's an, an emphatic term. Think of it as kind of almost like a real gentle shove. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, 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 I want to push you to, to love and, and to good works. And, and by the way, it's not a, it's not a passive term. And, and it's, it's those terms, watch out or, or provoke. They're, they're things that we should be doing now. And they're things that we should continually do. So how do we do verse 24? You know, how do we provoke one another to love and good deeds? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 25, or let me go back to 24. And let us watch out for one another to pro- provoke one, love and good works. Verse 25, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So how do we do verse 24? Well, it's right there in verse 25. We can't stop meeting together. We can't stop. That's, that's how we do verse 24 uh, is in verse 25. We come together and we meet together. The word neglect there means th- this whole idea of separating the connection. It's like you, you're, 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 you're ripping the connection or you're breaking the connection or you're pulling it away from, from its power source. We can't encourage each other. Um, we can't challenge each other. We can't um, help each other. We can't do life together if we are separated. The writer of Hebrews says that we can't abandon the idea of the practice of life together. And notice the, the, the writer says that, that as some are in the habit of doing. He says we can't neglect coming together as some are in the habit. And that word habit there, it, it's, it's the Greek word for ethos. And it just kind of means, it just becomes part of your routine, your life. Now, part of... Scripture says that we should do life together, but these Christians, these followers of God, have fallen out of their, their new habit is that they're no longer coming together because they've, they, 
they no longer see value to them in the together, or they value something else. They put greater value on something else than, than doing what God has called them to do. And you can't, you can't do together if we stop coming together, if we stop meeting together. Uh, Bonhoeffer uh, wrote it this way, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. How else can we stir one another to love and good deeds unless we come together? Now, before you say, well, you know, we, we have, when Bonhoeffer wrote this, Jimmy, he didn't have a cell phone. We can text one another now. Okay, we can, we can Facebook one another now. We can, we can Insta one another. We can Snapchat. We can do all these things now right here on this bad boy. But what I would say is that there is actually no substitution for face-to-face -face interaction. And then some of you might say, well, Jimmy, they have this app on the phone that's FaceTime. So you can hush now with all your points. But I'll say it again. When God is talking to us, about relationships he's not talking about a face to a screen but he's talking about person to person one-on-one -on -one, groups of people getting together to do life together we're here's the truth we are some of the most connected generation but we're also one of the loneliest generations we become isolated god created us for community and study after study that, that, that we see not just this harvard one but other others of them say that life really is better together and we know that because that's how God created so the question becomes then why is life better why is together better well, I, I, I want to give you some real quick the first one is this is we have help for the heavy lifting in life we have help for the heavy lifting in life and I don't want you to raise your hands but maybe just mentally raise your hand here how many of you would say right now that that you've got some heavy lifting going on in your world you know just life life is kind of just kind of pressing on you and you could use you would like to have some help with that heavy lifting galatians 6 2 probably a familiar passage if you've if you've grown up reading your bible or you've grown up in church you've probably heard this help carry one another's burdens and in this way you will obey the law of christ now no no big surprise here but life can be difficult life can be overwhelming we can feel like I can't do this anymore. And when you're living life alone, apart from community, apart from together, then it's easy to feel like I'm, I'm not going to be able to make it. But the beauty of together is, is you have someone who walks with you, someone, someone who helps you, uh, someone who shares the burden. In, in this Galatians passage, Paul isn't saying tolerate each other. And he isn't saying like, you know, just put up with one another. No, but what he's talking about is like, Arm in arm, shul help shoulder this, this burden, each member's burden. Keep on bearing one another's burdens. Uh, my Bible said carry, yours may say bear, but, but the whole idea is those verbs are in the same tense, and it's, it's, this, it's this deal that, that, that we keep doing. It's a habitual practice. that We don't give up on one another, but we come together. It's not just a one-time shot. It's not just that, you know, I got you. I, I'll cover you this time, but, you know, you're on your own. It's not that. It's you and I saying we're walking this path together, this journey, this season, however long it takes, but we're going to go together, and I'm going to keep going with you for the heavy lifting of life. There was a, a mission trip, a men's mission trip we were on not that long ago, uh, a few years, I don't remember. I think uh, Sam Chacon was on there, Dave Pauzinski was there. there was a, it was a smaller group than we normally take, but we were, we were at this, we were helping this do some construction on this home and this home was going to be used kind of as a as a not just a home for this family but it was going to be sort of a ministry hub like things were going to be happening in this home for the community and so part of what we had to do was we had to lay this cement floor now i don't know if you ever worked with do you guys say cement or cement okay well if you don't say it my way then you're wrong i'm just kidding yeah i say cement so that was a big, we had that big discussion on our last mission. Anyway, so we, we, we're laying this cement. Now I'm going to be thinking about cement. Um, and um, we, so we drove up to this place where the, where the site is, and, and there's, no, there's no mixer. You know how, you know, here in the beauty of, of, of construction here in the United States is this big cement truck comes and just lays it all out there. Well, when, when we drove up, you know, there's this giant pile of rock and then there's this giant pile of sand, and then there's, just, then there's just these cement bags, and it's just, and a water hose, and then worse yet, shovels. 
And so the, you know what that was going to mean? That was going to mean, guess what? We were the cement mixers. And so, you know, so you get out there and you start, you, you, you're doing, I mean, literally most of your day is just doing this over and over and over again. And, and, and I don't know about Sam and the other guys, but to me, I thought, Lord, I'm going to die here. This is, this is, this is how I'm going to go out because it just felt like an eternity that we were, that we were doing this. And it was just, it was just on and on and on. And we kept doing this. And I, I remember this. Uh, then uh, all of a sudden, where we're working, this, this, uh, I think it was a little Toyota pickup or something, came, drove up, or maybe it was a car, I can't remember. But anyway, in this car was, was the pastor of the local church who, was, who knew this family, was a member of this church, and a lot, like four or five other, other men, young men. And I, I, it was, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption, but when he finally escaped and he fell to his knees and he was like that, when these guys came out of the car and started doing what we were doing, I, that's what it was for me. I just fell to my knees, and I was weeping. And I gave these guys some awkward hugs for a long, long time. <laughs> because what, ha what happened was is that you know, they immediately jumped in, and it was just like we all kind of just stepped back for a second. And they, were, they, they started going. I mean, they just had, and they were just, man, they were just moving like that. And I'm not exaggerating when I say it was one of the happiest moments in my life. But here's the deal, when, when they, you know, after like a, a short little break, I mean, seeing those guys go, you know what it did to, at least to me or to the rest of us, it was just, it kind of energized us. And we kind of got back going again, and we, we started going in there, and man, it was just such, it was such a huge deal to have some other people come in and help us literally do some of the heavy lifting. And that's, that's the beauty of together, together. Uh, means that we don't have to shoulder this alone. And some people may say, well, you know what? I don't, I don't need together. I don't need it. I don't need community. Well, I would say, you know what? I bet there's somebody in community or somebody in together who might need you. God commanded us to carry each other's burdens and together really is better. So there's strength for the heavy lifting. Uh, next one is there's wisdom in numbers. There's wisdom in numbers. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of the arrogant fool who rejects God's wisdom is right in his own eyes. But a wise and prudent man is he who listens to counsel. There's a phrase that you've probably heard, but it's, it's a term called negative, negative self-talk. And it's basically kind of your, your inner critic. And uh, we, all have, we all have one. But to the extent of how loud that voice is or how influential uh, that voice is in our life, just it varies from person to person. But basically, negative self-talk, it, it, it can be quite damaging. It, it takes on different forms. It can, sound, it can sound kind of grounded at times where it says, I'm not good at this, so maybe I should avoid attempting it for my own personal safety, uh, for example. Or it can just sound downright mean. Your inner critic can say, I can never do anything right. It may take on... It may sometimes take on like a, a, a this, it kind of evaluates you like, I just got to see on this test, so I guess I'm not good at math, but then that could quickly delve into, well, um, I, I'll probably fail this class, which means I'm never going to, to, to get into college. You see, instead of, it, it was I got to see, but now all of a sudden I'm going to fail and I'm never going to reach, reach my goals. And there's some really bad stuff that can happen when you let that negative self-talk just kind of, really get loud in your head i mean one of them it's, it's limited thinking right you tell yourself you can't do something and if you tell yourself often enough then guess what it becomes true not only does it become true here but you start saying out loud it becomes your own truth uh perfectionism all of a sudden being good or being great at something isn't enough you think it has to be perfect and here's the here's the 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 really negative part of it is you think perfect being perfect is attainable and we all know that perfection is not because we're not perfect, but you strive. You're never happy with good enough. And then, you know what? Negative self-talk can lead to feelings of depression. Matter of fact, it can, it, if it's left unchecked, it can be super, super damaging. Negative self, it, it, just, it just has that bad habit of making things way bigger than they really are. You don't do well on something, so that means you're not good at anything. Or you, you have a conflict with someone, and all of a sudden that means that this relationship, it's just doomed to fail. It's never gonna be good at another It'll never repair itself. I'll never do this. And never and always are, are terms that your negative, negative self-talk uses. You see, together is better because then what happens is together you have multiple inputs in your life that help combat all that negativity. 
If all you hear is you all the time, then the only input you have in, is you all the time. And you all the time in your head makes things worse than they really are. And sometimes you in your head make things better than they really are. You kind of have a, you inflate your ego. But when there's together, you have multiple inputs. And you have multiple inputs when you're trying to make life's decisions. You have people who, who can help you uh, evaluate things and say, hey, listen, don't go down that road. Or when you're, they catch you doing something that maybe is not healthy for you, they can say, listen, stop that. Or before you, you, you invest in a relationship, they can kind of help you think through some things, but just kind of help you. We all need someone to help us to get back on the rails when maybe we start buying in into certain lies about ourselves, or we start buying into certain lies about our faith or, or about our world around us. We all need someone to give us a lift when circumstances seem to dictate that this whole world is against us. And that passage in Proverbs is so true. It's, it's foolish just to listen to you. Uh, and it's foolish to think that you have all the answers and that you always know what's right and what's best and that you think that your voice really is the only voice that matters. Wisdom it's really found in listening to others. I remember back in 2009, I was doing some, some counseling. I was dealing with some anxiety and, and, and depression. And in my head, I, I had this idea that I was, I was really needed, that I was, I was somebody really important, that, that things were gonna fall apart um, if I was not in control, if I was not in charge. And, and I would tell myself that to the point where I really, that's what I was believing, that it had to be me. And if it wasn't me, it was gonna fall apart. It was gonna be bad. Yeah, it, it, would never, it would never get better. And um, so I, I got anxious because I didn't like where I was in my life and, and I wanted it to be different and depressed because no one else seemed to be thinking that I was as important as I thought I was. And, and so things weren't going the way that I wanted to go. And I remember sitting in a counseling session one time and uh, my counselor, she was in her chair and I was on the couch, you know, just typical counselor setting kind of thing. And I was kind of vocalizing what I was feeling. And so she she after I finished, she kind of leaned in, you know, just leaned in and she looked at me and she said, so you're telling me God can't accomplish his will and he can't do what he needs to do without you. And I looked at her and I wanted to say, shut your mouth. <laughs> but the only thing I could do was kind of drop my head and laugh a little. I go, that's exactly right. I'm thinking that it's no good unless it's me. And I've completely lost the perspective the wisdom that God, God can do anything and he uses multiple people and God's got a plan for me but my plan needs to be his plan and not mine. And here's the thing, it, I feel like if, if, if I would have tried to figure that on my own, I mean, maybe I would have at some point but you know, on my own, it's, it's my belief that I might still be stuck. I might be trying to live life in <laughs> isolation, trying to fly solo and and that could have led to some disastrous results. And, and because, you know, the voice in my head was telling me these things that weren't true. And I needed the wisdom, the godly wisdom of others to speak into my life. We need to stop trying to be Superman or Superwoman. We need to stop being so arrogant. And we need to stop being foolish and let people, let the right people into our lives who can give us the wisdom that we need and the help that we need to shut down that inner critic and to help keep us from making mistakes in our life that would most definitely that we would make if we just kind of kept doing life alone because together really is better. And another reason it's better is because it gives us the accountability that we, we may not want, but we so desperately need. It gives us accountability. Accountability that we may not want, but we need. Proverbs 27, 17. If you grew up in church, you've probably heard this. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. When you're, when you're going at life alone, no one knows what's going on. No one knows when you're hurting. No one knows when you're missing. No one knows when you're spiraling. No one knows when you need encouragement. No one knows when, when you need help. Uh, no one knows when you're not doing what you should be doing. Um, sure, you can, you can lie. You can fake your way through it. You can, you can fool people. You can make everyone think that life is good, but until you let people in, no one knows. And here's the deal. Iron can't sharpen iron from a distance. There has to be connection, right? You ever tried to, to sharpen a knife 
and never touch the knife? It doesn't work, does it? It only becomes sharp through the friction. It only becomes sharp when there's the connection. There has to be interaction. We need to allow people into our lives who have the permission to tell us the hard stuff, to challenge us, to, to you know, to kick us in the bottom if, if we need it. It's not going to be easy, and it's not going to always be fun, and it's not always going to be what we want to hear. We want to hear people cheering us on. We want to hear the encouragement, but you know what? We also have to hear the hard stuff too, but it's necessary. The hard stuff is necessary for us to grow as followers of Christ. It's necessary for us to improve, to get better, to get stronger. I told you guys not that long ago that I had a membership to a gym that I, I had for years, um, and, but that I never went. I paid for it, but I never, ever went. You know why I never, ever went? Because no one was waiting for me. No one was waiting for me. No one was counting on me to be there. I wasn't going to let anyone down if I didn't show up. I wasn't going to have to answer to anyone if I didn't show up. I wasn't going to have to make any kind of a, make up an excuse like, hey, I was busy in surgery or, you know, I was, I was on a conference call with the White House or I was rescuing, you know, kittens from trees, which I would never do that. But anyway, just, I, I didn't have to make up an excuse because no one was there. No one was waiting on me. And so guess what? I never went. I didn't, have, I didn't have any accountability. And accountability, it, it, it can't happen apart from community. It's, 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 um, it, it's, it's not a solo act. And here's the deal. If no one is waiting for you, then no one will know if you don't show up. If no one's waiting for you, then no, one, no one's going to know that you didn't show up. And if no one knows where you're trying to get, then no one's going to know when you get lost. So we need that accountability. And accountability happens together because life together really is, is better. Life's better. Or four there, and ministry is multiplied. Why is, to, why is together better? Well, because ministry is multiplied. Ecclesiastes 4.9, it says, two can accomplish more than twice as much as one, for the results can be much Better and this this is a pretty obvious one. I don't have to spend a lot of time here, but we can do more together. We saw it last week on our connection Sunday um, with all the ministries that were out in the rotunda. That, that this whole idea of it was a great example of of together. We need each other to accomplish God's given mission for our church. It can't just be our pastor. It can't just be up to Chad to accomplish the mission and vision of this church. It can't just be up to the staff. Um, it's got to be all of us. We've got to be all in or we're not going anywhere as a church. We have to do this together. We need each other to accomplish the mission and vision of the church. And oh, by the way, we need each other to accomplish the mission and vision of our lives, our own individual lives, because it's, it's, it's better when, when we're doing it together. And here's something else to think about when, when we're thinking about you accomplish more together. Ministry is a whole lot more fun and a whole lot more exciting when you do it with someone else, when you do it together. Some of the best relationship moments I've had on, 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 uh, here at this church have been on mission trips, have been on doing ministry together and getting to know some of the guys that, that, that have gone on mission trips with. Because you know what you do? You just hear, you hear their stories because you're working together, you're doing ministry together, and so you just naturally, you start talking. Just the other day, I was, I was doing a, a card writing ministry thing with some of our, our, our Cornerstone ministry, and, and Carlina Chandler, some of you know her, she was, she was the one that showed up. And so for about an hour, we're writing these cards to different people, uh, notes of encouragement, and just letting people know that we're praying for it. And in that hour, guess what? We talked. And I got to know a little bit more about Carlina. I got to know a little bit more about Charles, her husband. I got to know a little bit about, about her story. She's got a some of you know she's got a school named after her, uh, Chandler Elementary. And oh, by the way, at, this is so funny. Um, so she's got a school named after her, right? And well, uh, they, they used to live out at Heritage Ranch, and, and Char Charlie played golf out there all the time. So when she got the school named after her, they actually named a bathroom on the golf course uh, after Charlie. So they didn't, want him to, they didn't want him to feel left out. But anyway, but the only reason we, we had that conversation is because we were what? We were just ministering together. We were both writing our cards. We were both doing our own thing, but we were doing it together. And so I got, I got to spend time. And oh, by the way, parents, uh, whether your kids are, are, are little or you've got a, a grown adult kids, some of the best relationship moments you'll ever have with your kids is when you do ministry together. 
It's some of the sweetest times that you'll have as, as a family. And uh, I may be wrong on this, and, and if I am wrong, just email Jeff, but everywhere where we see where we see Jesus, the only time that we see Jesus pulling away to be by himself is when he's, he's spending time in prayer, when he's, when he's, when he's working and uh, growing his relationship with his Father and rejuvenating himself. But everywhere else we see in Scripture, we see Jesus ministering together. And he's got people, he's got people with him. Even when he pulls away sometimes, he still brings uh, uh, Peter, James, and John. But the whole idea is that, that ministry is better together. We can accomplish more together. And what is God calling you to do? And who can you take with you? Because together really is better. Another thing that together, together gives us is it just gives us a different perspective. It gives us a different perspective. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. And this is in the message, and I love this translation. Uh, it says it this way. So we're not giving up how we, how could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us. On the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today and gone tomorrow, but the things we can't see now will last forever. We said earlier that there's, there's wisdom in numbers, but there's also perspective in numbers too. Doing life on your own means that you just get one, you get one set of eyes that's looking at the problem, one set of eyes that's looking at the issue, one set of eyes looking at the circumstance, one set of eyes looking at the obstacle. But in that 2 Corinthians passage, that, that it's all about perspective. And Paul is telling the people of Corinth, he's telling the believers there, the church there, that there's, there's so, that, like what you're going through now, it's a big deal, but it's not the only deal. There is so much more than what you see. Some of your Bibles in verse 18, it may have said, that, said it this way, that there, light and momentary affliction. And the whole idea that, that what we're going through now, it's coming and going quickly and therefore being merely a brief interruption of a more enduring state. But left to ourselves, I don't think that we see that. You know, when, when we're in the middle of something, we don't, we don't see the, the light and momentary part of it. We don't see that this is, this is fleeting. That we, we don't see that there's more to life than just this, than the here and now. We, and, and Paul is telling the church of Corinth, listen, there's, there, you need this perspective. You're not seeing this. And we don't see different perspectives when we're the only perspective that we're looking through. How many, I know I've said this probably like a thousand times, but you know, you're looking at something or you're thinking about something, or you're trying to solve a problem, and someone comes in and just points something out, you like, oh, I never thought about that. I, I, I didn't see it. No way. Now, show me that again. It happens to me all the time, mostly because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of not very smart, but, but all the time, it's just like, oh, wow. Thank you for that. One of the, one of the ways that, that I, I, happens to me a lot is like, I don't do construction projects, but you know, I, I look at things and I'm just, I, I tend to think about the most complicated way to do it, but I, I get my dad on the phone or, or he's there with me and he shows it. I was like, ah, I never would have thought of that. Amazing. But here's the thing. By myself, I don't know what to do or I only see it one way. But in numbers, together, I get a different perspective. I see life in a whole different way. I see life in a whole new way, ways that I never thought about, and it's good. Life really is better together. And here's the, here's the last thing. Together is better because it's a result of a relationship with God. Together is a result of a relationship with God. Look at 1 John 1, 7. It says it's on the screens. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, talking about Jesus, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Fellowship with God, a relationship with God, community with God leads us to community with one another. One commentary put it this way. Fellowship with one another is the result of believers' mutual walk in the light and is a gauge of the sign of divine fellowship. Listen to this. He who consistently has trouble maintaining fellowship with others, walking in the light, should examine his own claim of fellowship with God. Wow. That's harsh language. 
saying if you don't do life together with other believers, then you got to look at your together with God, and you got to examine that. Because the deal is, life with God, together with God, is going to lead to life with one another. If you walk in the light as he himself is in the light, here we go, if, then, you'll have fellowship with one another. You see, because because God designed us to be in community. Community with him and community with one another. That doesn't mean that you have to like everyone. It doesn't mean you're going to be everyone's best friend. You don't, have, you don't have time for that. You don't have the emotional capability to do that. But you do have you do have the ability to have together in your circle. But what, but what it's saying is that a natural consequence of, grow, of a growing relationship with Christ, walking in that light, is that we'll be drawn to the together experience. We won't run. Here's the deal. If our relationship with God is, is real, then we're not going to run from the wisdom of others. We're not going to run from the, letting people help us or we're helping other people with the heavy lifting of life. We're not going to run from accountability. We will look for opportunities to serve together, and we will welcome different, different set of eyes, different perspective in our life that helps us discover God's will for our lives. Here's a great, a, a great, a great quote from uh, Paul Tripp. He's a, a pastor, author. I love how he says, he says, we weren't created to be independent, autonomous, or self-sufficient we were made to live in a humble worshipful and loving dependency upon God and in a loving and humble interdependency with others our lives were designed to be community projects yet the foolishness of sin tells us that we have all that we need within ourselves see how he said that the foolishness of sin tells us that we have all that we need within ourselves so we settle for relationships that never go beneath the casual we defend ourselves when people around us point out our weakness or a wrong and we hold our struggles within not taking advantage of the resources god has given us that's isolation that's alone that's life by yourself and that's not how you were created you we were created for together and together is really really better